Can we have question from mic one, please? My name is Das Anthony Das, and I am a trainer by profession. My question is like this. Doctor mentioned about universal brotherhood, and doctor also mentioned that the similarities, uh, the way we see God. Uh, he mentioned various religion. I, I would just like to ask this. Will it be okay for people of a different faith, let's say Christians, can Christians uh, refer to the, the, their gods or the God as uh, Allah? The Raza asked a very good question. That can people of other faith refer to their God as Allah? The answer was given in my lecture that if the God who you call as Allah fits in this four line definition, you can refer, otherwise, you can't. And I gave you a sample, a test, that there are some human beings in the world who call Bhagavan Rajneesh to be God. Now when you put Bhagavan Rajneesh to the test of Surya class, it fails. So if you call Bhagavan Rajneesh as Allah, it is totally wrong. The same way the God you are worshipping. Which God do you worship as? I am from the Christian faith. According to Christian faith, I am a student of compared religion. I know what Bible says. I have studied the Bible. I can quote the Bible from my mind. I am asking you, who do you believe to be God? The creator of earth. Is creator no problem, but do you believe Jesus to be God? Jesus is the son of God. Son of God. If God has son, then he is not God. <laughs> then... okay. The Bible has got sons by the tons. If you read the Bible, Adam was son of God. Ephraim was son of God. Israel was son of God. All those who are led by the spirit of God are sons of God. In that idiom, Anyone who followed the commandment of God is a godly person. In that way, I've got no problem. In Hindi, we say, beta is around. So no problem, beta. But if someone says, janava beta, that means he's insinuating. So only calling son of God is a good word. But if you say, begotten son, do you believe Jesus is begotten son? Jesus is the son of God. So son of God, even Ephraim is son of God, Israel is son of God. So do you mean that Ephraim and Israel is the same as Jesus, peace be upon him? I think uh, it would not be fair to question in that manner because if you were to see Christianity from a Christian point of view... Not Christian point of view. I okay. see Christianity according to Bible point of view. Okay. If, you okay. want to, if you want to understand any religion, go to the scriptures. If you want to understand Islam, don't look at me. Don't look at Muslims. You analyze the Quran and the Sai Hadith. If you want to understand Christianity, you have to study the Bible. If I have to understand Hinduism, I have to study the Vedas and the other scriptures. So what you have to know that as a student of comparative religion, I'm a student of comparative religion. I've studied the Bible, I've studied the Vedas, I've studied the Quran. And we have question and cessation for people to correct us. If you disagree with me, you have a right to disagree, but you have to tell me why. So I've given the talk here. And I know the concept of God according to Bible very well. I'm not bothered what the church says. Because for me, Bible is important, not the church. So similarly, as far as the question is concerned, you can call the God you worship as Allah if your God fits in this four-line definition. So in this four-line definition, even your Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, does not fit, and even Jesus Christ, peace be upon his father does not fit because God cannot have son. So both of them you cannot call as God. Hope that answers the question. So, doctor, you disqualify Christians from calling Allah simply because of the fact that Christians believe that Jesus is the son of God. So that's the reason. If he's the son of God, begotten son, I disqualify. Because this statement, what you say, son of God, is referring to your Bible, Gospel of John, chapter number 3, verse number 16. I'm quoting. And you know that very well. Gospel of John, chapter number 3, verse number 16 says, God soul of the world, that he gave his only begotten son, whosoever believeth in him, shall not die, but have everlasting life. Uh, You're fine. Doctor, the way you are, seem to be answering my question, the spirit you are answering my question, uh, the essence you are answering my question, doesn't seem to be promoting this brotherhood between you and me. It is putting a separation between you Correct, and me. Because if you go against the Bible, I will separate from you. If you are towards the Bible, I am with you. Anyone, any human being who wants to create disharmony because he is going away from a scripture, I will not agree with him. Because you are going away from the scripture and going towards your church. I am saying go back to your Bible. You quote the Bible. I am giving references. 
What you are saying is that out of your own mind. Now, if you try and take the Christian away from the Bible, I will not agree with you. You quote the Bible and you quote the verses what Jesus Christ, peace be upon you, spoke. There is not a single unequivocal statement in the complete Bible where Jesus Christ, peace be upon himself, says that I am God or where he said worship me. And I told you, if any Christian, anyone in KL or in Malaysia or anywhere in the world shows me from any version of the Bible where Jesus Christ, peace be upon himself, says that I am God or where he says worship me, I, Dr. Zakir Naik, am ready to accept Christianity. If Christian means a person who follows the teachings of Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, we Muslims are more Christian than the Christian themselves. <laughs> Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, according to the Gospel of John, he was circumcised on the eighth day. Brother, are you circumcised? No, I'm not. I'm circumcised. So I'm following the teachings of Jesus Christ or you? If you read the Bible, it's mentioned in the book of Ephesians, chapter number 5, verse number 18, don't have alcohol. It's mentioned in the book of Proverbs, chapter number 20, verse number 1, that do not be drunk with wine. Brother, do you have alcohol? I don't, I have never tasted alcohol in my lifetime. Uh, but the Christian as a whole have or not? Say again? The Christians have as a whole or not? I haven't. I'm asking the Christians as a whole. I haven't. The Christian <laughs> as a whole. Do they have I or not? I haven't. I would not want to speak for other people. Fine. Christians. You don't have. Or do you have pork? Say again. Do you have pork? Yes, I have. Okay, now I'm quoting you. If you read the Old Testament, if you read the book of Deuteronomy, chapter number 14, verse number 8, in the book of Isaiah, chapter 65, verse number 2 to 5, in the book of Leviticus, chapter number 11, verse number 7 and 8, it says you should not have pork. I don't have pork, you have pork. If Christian means a person who follows the teachings of Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, we Muslims are more Christian than the Christian themselves. I am promoting communal harmony. I'm quoting your Bible and Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, said in the Gospel of Matthew, chapter number 5, verse number 17 to 20, if you break one jot or tittle from the Old Testament, you shall never go to paradise. One law if you break of the Old Testament, you shall not go to paradise. I am more Christian than the Christian themselves. I can go on and on. I can go on and on talking about the similarities. There are differences. I am not here to talk about difference. I am talking similarities. But the problem is, if you say Bible is the word of God, why aren't you following the commandments of the Bible? Why? So this is the problem with the followers, that when they want to follow the scripture, what my solution is, simple solution. One simple solution. I tell that at least believe that one book is the word of God. So Christian would not mind, okay, fine, I agree, Bible is the word of God. The Hindu will say, I don't mind believing Veda to be the word of God. And the Muslim will say, I don't mind believing Quran to be the word of God. I tell them, let us agree to follow what is common in all these three scriptures. What is different, we'll discuss tomorrow. Right or wrong, we'll discuss tomorrow. Let us agree today that let us follow 100% what is common in all these three scriptures. As I told in my lecture, that all these scriptures talk about one God. This God has got no images. He has got no picture, no portrait, no father, no mother. I have given quotations from the Old Testament, from the New Testament. I have given quotations from the Old Testament, New Testament, from the Vedas, from the Quran. Point number one. Let us agree there is one God. Worship Him alone, not Trinity. Not triune God, one God. Next, I had given the talk yesterday in Jawabaro. Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam in the major world religious scriptures. Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is not only mentioned in the Quran, he's prophesied in the Old Testament, in the New Testament, in the Hindu scriptures, in the Vedas, in the Upanishads, in the Puranas. He prophesies in the Parsi scriptures, in the Buddhist scriptures. Let us agree to believe that Prophet Muhammad is the last and final messenger. So easy. All the scriptures say don't have alcohol. Bible says don't have alcohol. Quran says don't have alcohol. The Hindu scripture, Manu Smithi says don't have alcohol. Let's stop having alcohol. So easy. Bible says do hijab. All the ladies should do hijab. They should cover their head. Only you see nuns and Mother Mary. You know Mother Mary? Mother Mary, her photograph is just like a Muslima. Properly covered. But when you see the other ladies, no. <laughs> if you read the first Corinthians, first Corinthians, chapter number 11, verse number 5 and 6, it says if the woman that does not cover her head, she dishonors her head, her head should be shaved off. Even in Islam, in Quran, it doesn't say that the woman who uncovers the head should be shaved off. This is how strict the Bible is for the woman to cover her head. But most of the Christian women, we see the heads uncovered. So I'm trying to get communal harmony, not discord. 
So please don't come here and say things which are wrong. Say again. Please don't come and lay allegation against me. I am bringing co-relationship. I am bringing communal harmony. That's the different thing that you want to go away from your Bible. I want to get you closer to your Bible. Thank you. Now, now I feel that it is not fair just because you follow certain things in the Bible, you become more Christian than Christians. I follow a lot of things which is also in the Muslim faith. And I know a lot of things the Muslims themselves don't follow in the Muslim faith. I'm sure you would agree with me. But would that make me more Muslim than Muslims? There is not a single statement you can give in the Quran as a whole. Not you may be better than one individual Muslim. He is a namesake Muslim. Muslim means a person who submits his will to God. If he says he submits and he does not submit, he's a pseudo Muslim. He will not go to Jannah. He will not go to Jannah. Just by saying that I'm a Muslim will not take him to paradise. I will openly say that. Unlike in your Christianity, that you believe Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, died for your sins according to your church, and you go to heaven. That's not part of the Bible. That's the teaching of the church. So I'm here to promote communal harmony, to let people know. And what I'm telling is quotation directly. You tell me what is common. You tell me one thing in the Quran which I don't follow. Show me I one can, thing. Tell I me can, one thing. One I, thing I in the Quran. Some, I can see something common in what both of us are saying. Sorry? One, I can see something common. There are many things common, not yes. something common. I can see something common. I can see. I can see. I didn't say you can see. I said that I can, I can see something common in what both of us are seeing. There are many. I can see that there are some Christians who do not follow Christianity as, as well as they should. And I can see there are some Muslims who do not follow what Islam teaches as they should. Not some Christians. According to statistics, majority Christians don't follow. According to statistics today, there are 7 billion people in the world. The people who profess the Christian faith, they may be close to 2 billion. The people that profess the Islamic faith, more than 1.5 billion. But the people who follow, the majority in the world are Muslims. Majority. The Christians, they, they, they don't follow. So as a whole, the religion, we have black sheep in our community. But as a whole, the religion which is maximum followed, the teaching of any religion that is Islam. I know there are black sheep in our community. There are many black sheep. But as a whole, as a percentage, today's statistics tell us, the religion which is maximum followed, the teaching based on the Quran, on the scripture, is number one Islam. That's the reason today, the fastest growing religion in the world is Islam. Brother, what's your, if you have any question, uh, yes, you can brother. pose a question or go behind the queue. Yes, brother. Pose your question. Shall I? Okay. I just like to end by saying, I would like to say that, okay, I rephrase. There are some Christians who are not following the Christian doctrine. There are some Muslims who do not follow the Muslim doctrine. I would I'd like to end by saying, however, I would not want to boost my ego by saying, I am more Muslim than Muslims. Thank you, sir. Brother said there are some Christians who don't follow, not some Christian, majority people who claim to be Christians are not following the Bible according to statistics. And I do agree that there are some Muslims who are black sheep who are not following. Those who don't follow the scripture, those who go against the Quran, they are not true Muslims. They may be part or they may be pseudo. But you can never say, never ever can you say until you accept that there is one God. And Prophet Muhammad is the messenger of God. You can never claim to be better than the Muslims. Can we have the next question from this mic? My name is Tina. Um, I'm a pharmacy student and I'm a Hindu. Dr. Zake, I just want to ask, you're from India. I'm not so sure whether you're familiar with this um, practice in, among Indians you know, um, regarding this leaf that you go and consult uh, someone and if you manage to find your leaf based on thumb pain and other things like that, your whole life, your name, parents' name, uh, past, future, what's going to happen is all written in that leaf. I don't know whether this is a practice of Hinduism or is something made by the temples or people. And if so, if everything is already written, how is it comparing Hinduism or maybe this practice with Islam, um, fate and free will? Thank you.
The sister posed the question that there may be certain practices in India about picking up leaf, which mentioned about the future. There are different types of practices. It may not be part of the scripture, but there are different, different types, mainly talking about the future. Jyotish, no, go to Jyotish, to a fortune teller. Go to fortune teller, different types. You see on the streets, there are many cards kept, and a parrot goes and picks up a card, and then they read, and that talks about the future. You go to a machine, put your date of birth, and the machine tells you something. Now, based on this, based on this, you go, it's very common, and people make a fast buck out of it. I'll first tell you about it. There was a psychologist in States who taught a class of 100 students, and at the end of a week, he said, I will tell you about your past to each student. And he wrote to each student separately. He gave them a chat. He said, don't open. You open together, and after you open, you tell me how accurate was I in my talking about your past. So all the students open, and 95% of the students, they said that the professor was more than 90% correct. 5% said that he was 80% correct. The key to it was the professor wrote the same thing for everyone. For example, you go to a machine and give a birth date, and the machine will tell you something bad is going to happen in the next 10 days. Even if 100 good things happen, something bad will happen. The next person, the machine will say that something good is going to happen. Even if 100 bad things happen, something good will happen. So most of these things, talking about the future, it's a big fuss. Sorry, I just wanted to say because like my family, it's a thing to do this. So my leaf was found and they read it. So things in it like, because, you know, science students try to think logically, rational, whether it's possible. Because sometimes when some things they say, for example, this is your mother's name, they got it correct. This is your father's name, they got it correct. And I think it's in Sanskrit, so it's like you have to believe entirely what the guy is saying because you can't check it yourself, whether it's right or wrong. At, uh, I think I was 16 when I read it, so they said the age where you read it was 16. There's two, like, maybe out of 10 things, 8 things it got correct, and it's like sometimes I try to think how do they do this, and it seems a lot of people also come, so it's like this logic and the faith, it's like a, it's, there's a fight there, which should I believe? I'll just come to it, sister. Let me complete my answer, and that will cover your question also. As I was saying, that most of the people that do is a big fast. It's a big gimmick, just to make fast money. What Quran says, which I mentioned in my talk, Surah Maida, chapter 5, verse number 90, Ya Ladin Amanu, O you believe in the Malkhamru or Mysuru, most certainly intoxicates and gambling. Wal Azabu al Aslamu, dedication of stones, divination of arrows, rich sumina mili shaitan, these are Satan's handiwork. First animal will come to fluent. Abstain from the handiwork that will be prosper. Here, Quran says alcohol, gambling, fortune telling. And dedication of stone. Fortune telling is same. These are sentence handiwork. Abstain from it that you may prosper. Quran does not say that no one can predict the future. See, many Muslims don't realize what the Quran says. Alcohol, gambling, fortune telling, dedication of stones. These are Satan's handiwork. Abstain from it. Quran does not say no one can predict the future. But most of the people who predict the future, they are just doing a gimmick to make fast money out of it. Based on the Quran and the Hadith, we come to know that there are Hadith of the Prophet Muhammad that there are jinns who listen and they pass on the message to certain people. We as Muslims should not be involved in it. It is prohibited. But that does not mean no one can predict the future. Most of the people who claim are all wrong. But there may be certain human beings who can predict the future. But we as human beings should not indulge in it, whether it's right or wrong. It will be bad for us. So based on this, the Quran says you should not indulge in it. Quran does not say you cannot. There are many people who talk about palm reading. And there are times when some people are 50% correct, some people are 70% correct. You put heads or tails, 50% will be right, sister. No, heads or tails, 50% will be right. So some people do it just by chance. There may be few, maybe a very small percentage who may have the art of knowing about the past. That is mentioned in the Hadith of Prophet Sallallahu But we as Muslims should not indulge in it. We should not indulge in black magic. We should not indulge in fortune telling.
why it will cause us harm so in this context sister we as muslims are not allowed there may be a very small percentage which may tell quite a major portion of your past or of your future a very small portion but we as muslims are not allowed to indulge in it that's a commandment like how we are not allowed to have alcohol we aren't allowed to gamble so indulging in it is not good it is prohibited the same thing i will tell you that as a human being if you agree that quran is the word of god the quran does not allow a human being to indulge in it it will be nothing but loss in the long run for you hope that answers the question sister now i mean like now once i've already seen it i rather would have not seen it but because now you know it and then it's stuck here it's a bit difficult sometimes when you want to just believe in fate or free will and then in this context do you believe that uh, we can still practice free will or is on fate ah uh, sister asked a question that if you know what is happening then can you practice free will as i told you there's no one you can say who can 100% talk about the future so even if you're like you said out of 10 things eight are coming correct you may never know the thing which hasn't come correct yet will come correct or not so you yourself said 80% correct so it may come may not so it's in the free will as far as islam is concerned islam we have to believe in destiny that is qadar it's one of the pillars of iman that we muslims should believe in qadar in destiny i will tell you what is destiny as far as islam is concerned that is clearly mentioned in the quran that allah subhanahu wa ta'ala when a child is born the father is wound on the neck it's mentioned in the quran everything what you're going to do allah knows but that does not interfere with your free will allah has given a free will for example if a teacher is teaching in a classroom for one year just before the final examination the teacher predicts that this student he will get first class he'll come out first in the class this student he gets second class this student he will fail it's just an example but don't feel bad <laughs> now when the examination takes place after the results out this student comes out first class first he gets second class this student fails now can the student who failed tell the teacher because the teacher predicted i will fail therefore i failed can he blame the teacher yes or no no why because the teacher knew this student intelligent used to do his homework used to attend the class throughout the year this student average this student used to go for movies play hooky bunk school so teacher predicted same way allah subhanahu wa taala is ilm gaib now the difference between the teacher and allah is the teacher as a human being can make a mistake can be right 99% but not 100% always allah has ilm gaib he has knowledge of the future but he has given you a free will for example you come at a cross road there is road 1 2 3 4 you can choose any you choose road 2 so allah knows in advance on this particular date on the 29th of september you will come at a cross road you will choose road 2 it is not because allah has mentioned you will choose road 2 you are choosing it is because you will be choosing allah road in advance for example after you pass standard 12 to a levels you can either become a doctor or engineer you choose to become a doctor so allah knows in advance that after you pass your a levels you will choose to become a doctor choice is yours not because allah has written you have become a doctor because you have chosen allah road in advance now once you have come at a cross road 1 2 3 4 you have taken road 2 you come at another cross road a b c d e you choose road d allah knows in advance that when you come at the next cross road you will choose road d so it is because you will be choosing allah road otherwise people will say it's mentioned my taqdeer i will commit murder i committed murder who's to blame allah is to blame not me if it's mentioned my destiny i'm going to rob i rob who's to blame allah is to blame allah gave you the option that after you finish your college you can either rob or earn by doing hard work you choose to rob so allah knows after you finish your college you could do hard work or you could rob you choose to rob so you can't blame allah allah knows in advance allah is ilm gaib so there is something like taqdeer destiny in islam but allah has given us a free will allah has given us a free will we are responsible 
Allah says in the Quran, in Surah Mulk, chapter number 67, verse number 2, Allah 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 so that's the reason Islam says don't indulge in fortune telling about the future. Now as you're saying something is always clicking here. So you may think that he may have told you okay at the age of 30 you'll die. So you may be thinking oh, I'm going to die. You may not die. So what if you have done a mistake forget it sister take it out. You lead your normal life try and find out which is the truth. What you have to do sister do a research. Do a research of various religious scriptures, which is the true scripture that will give you serenity, calmness, peace of mind. Read that scripture, follow it, and forget what the fortune teller has told you. Even if it comes out to be right, no problem. You do what you feel is right based on your research. That how to lead a life. So this Quran, sister, is the last and final guidance given by Almighty God to humanity. It's not meant only for the Muslims or the Arabs or the Malay. It's meant for the whole of humanity. And if you read this book, inshallah, you would get peace of mind. I request the volunteer to gift you a copy of the English translation of the Quran. You read it, inshallah, it will give you peace of mind. Thank you. Hope that answers the question. Thank you. Uh, my name is Shah. I'm a psychology student. Okay, previously, doctor mentioned that Allah is God and not just for the Muslims but also for the non-Muslims, for the blacks, for the whites, as doctor quoted earlier. So, okay, I can accept that Allah is God for everybody. But there was an incident a few years ago uh, on this date called September 11, when there were two towers which were filled with... Um, I would presume that they were of the Christian faith, these American citizens. And these two towers were knocked down by an aeroplane which was hijacked and controlled by, from what I have heard, uh, controlled by Muslims. So in that sense, what I see is that the brother is killing the brother. And uh, I just want to know what doctor has to say about that. Sister asked a very good question, referring to 9-11, September 11, just, just passed away a couple of weeks back, that the Twin Towers was there, it was knocked down by a plane, there were majority Christian in it, knocked down what she heard, and she's very clear, mashallah, she heard that Muslim controlled the plane. Sister, till now, it's only a hypothesis. It's a hypothesis that Muslims were there, it was 19 Arabs who hijacked the plane and they banged on the Twin Towers. According to 75 scientists, American, all of them Christian, according to 75 American scientists and professors, if you have seen the documentary Loose Change, no, Loose Change is a documentary made by a young American. He takes interviews and these 75 scientists and professors say that we cannot ever believe that 19 Arabs can hijack a plane and knock into the Twin Towers. It is an inside job done by the White House. White House, you know White House. <laughs> now, I hear everything. I am hearing from the news, Arabs have done it. I am hearing from news that Muslims have done it. They found the passport of an Arab in the plane crash, which burned the pillars and all the iron rods, but did not burn the passport of the Arab. So someone wrote that next time they should make the army suit of the Americans in their passport material. <laughs> I have given a full lecture on its terrorism Muslim monopoly. It is so effective. My lecture is so effective that the Westerners don't want to be in the country today. <laughs> My lecture is so effective, so logical. These people, these Americans, I'm quoting, huh? I'm only giving you statistics that they had an interview with the person who made the Twin Towers. He said that it's impossible that the fuel of the plane can melt the Twin Tower. And if you see the photograph, it was the Twin Tower came in stages as though there were bombs planted in advance. There are many hypotheses. For example, there's a boy who's speaking on the mobile. Mother, mother, I am Mark Binhang. I am Mark Binhang speaking. 
point to be noted at that time in 9-11, 2001, more than 10 years back, mobile could not reach that level, point number one. Point number two, when a son speaks to the mother, why will you say Mark Binang? When I will speak to my mother, I'll say Zakir, I'll not say I'm Zakir Naik speaking. <laughs> when I speak to my mother, I'll say I'm Zakir, I'll not say Zakir Naik. So what you realize, they are trying to make a story and blame. And that person on the mobile told the mother that it was Muslims. So all these documentaries you see, Loose Chain, Fahrenheit, many documentaries. If you ask me who did it, I would say I don't know. But as a logical person, the logical proof of loose change is much more logical than the proof given to me by the American government. And then they want to attack Afghanistan. Afghanistan gives me proof, they want to give proof to Musharraf. Why? And I speak so openly, Westerners believe in freedom of speech, but they don't like my talk. So what they do, then prevent me to enter in the country. I'm telling you, let's have a dialogue. As far as the question is concerned, who did it keep it aside? I know that there were more than 3,000 human beings who were killed in Twin Towers. If you want the Islamic answer, as I mentioned in my talk, as per Surah Maida, chapter number 5, verse number 32, if anyone kills any other human being, unless it be for murder or for spreading corruption in the land, it is as though he has killed all of humanity. So whoever did the Twin Towers, whoever did it, whether it was inside job, whether the American did or Muslim did, whoever did it, it is wrong, prohibited, haram, I condemn it. <laughs> you tell Muslim did, I, I don't know. Whoever did it, whether Muslim or non-Muslim, American, X, Y, Z, whoever did, more than 3,000 Americans were killed, even if there were non-Americans in it, it is a haram. I also go on to say, more than 50 people were killed in the tube blast of London. In London tube blast, some say 52, some say 54. So I say more than 50. When more than 50 people were killed, I condemn it. In Bombay, where they were trained bomb blast in 2006, more than 180 people were killed. I condemn it. But I don't put a full stop there. I also say that I condemn the thousands of innocent people killed in Afghanistan, in Palestine, in Iraq. Now coming to the secret, coming to the secret. No, I condemn 3,000 Americans killed, everyone is happy. I condemn more than 50 people killed in London tube blast, everyone is happy. I condemn more than 180 people killed in Bombay, everyone is happy. But when I say I condemn the thousands of innocent people killed in Afghanistan, in Iraq and Palestine, the Home Secretary of UK doesn't like it, so she bans me. <laughs> Freedom of speech. When you want to criticize the Prophet of Islam, Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, freedom of speech. And I said, I condemn the innocent people killed in Afghanistan. You know, I'm careful, you know, because I'm a debater. Because if I say thousands of people killed in Afghanistan, they say, oh, Zakir is supporting terrorists in Afghanistan. So I'm going out of my way to say thousands of innocent people killed in Afghanistan. They may be terrorists, Allah Alam, I don't know. So I'm so careful. When I said America, I didn't say innocent Americans. As any American you kill, I condemn. In the Twin Towers, in the London bomb blast, in the Bombay bomb blast. But in Afghanistan, I said innocent, so it doesn't go down the throat. You know why? Because Zakir gets large audiences. No? Today, the media wants to malign Islam, but if they have a person who's clarifying the picture of Islam, they want to ban him. Let's have a dialogue, come to common terms. So, as far as killing innocent people, sister, whoever did it is to be condemned. But don't follow the media. The media today is the most powerful weapon in the world. It can convert black into white, it can convert day into night, hero into a villain, villain into a hero. Uh, that's why I said, doctor, from what I have heard. I agree, your question was very I'm good. I'm not sure, you're not you, sure, I'm not sure. Yeah, I, don't, not, I don't think anybody... I thank you, is, you're not like the American, very good. And neither are you like the... <laughs> thank you, thank neither you. Neither are you like the Home Secretary of UK. Your question was very clear, and my answer is clear. Whoever did it, it is wrong killing any innocent people. And just one more I like to give an incidents. When I gave a talk in Bombay on is terror in the Muslim monopoly, I gave a talk. After the train bomb blast, the police of Bombay told me, Zakir, you're popular among the Muslims, I don't give a talk. And the Muslims said, oh, the only Zakir is truthful, he can talk to the police. 
So I was on the edge of the sword. Both are telling me to give a talk. Bakra mil gaya. And I told that, while I was guiding even the police and the Muslim ummah, that when you have a doubt about a Muslim and you arrest a few, no problem, you are rounding up 3,000 Muslims just to catch few terrorists. Whether you catch those 5, 10 terrorists or not, you are creating another 100 terrorists. If you really have doubt and proof regarding few Muslims, catch, we will cooperate with you. But in mass, you are catching Muslim youngsters. And few years back, before 2006, in the early part of 2000, there was a genocide, a massacre of the Muslims in Gujarat. Thousands of Muslims were killed, thousands of Muslim women were raped. And in retaliation, that's what the media says, inverted commas, retaliation. There was bomb blast in Bombay. So one Hindu gets up and tells me, Dr. Zakir Naik, if I would have been in the place of a Muslim, and if thousands of Muslims were killed, and if my mother was raped, I would do the same thing what the Muslims have done here. And the people started to clap. I said, brother, what you're behaving is like a normal human being, emotional. I agree with you, normal. But I, the Muslim, cannot do that. Because my religion does not permit me to do that. My religion does not permit me to kill a single innocent human being. Even if some Hindus in Gujarat have killed Muslims, it does not give me permission to kill an innocent Hindu living in Bombay. I cannot do it. I know you're emotional, even I have emotions, but I cannot follow my emotion because my Quran does not permit me. It does not permit me. If I catch the culprit in Gujarat and give him to the law and punish him, no problem. But retaliating by killing an innocent human being in Bombay, imagine the family of that person, innocent person who's killed, will 100% always be enemy of Islam. I'm here to spread peace. So in Islam, you cannot get emotional and go against the law of the Creator. The law of the Creator is very clear that you cannot kill any innocent human being. If you kill even one innocent human being, it's as though you have killed the whole of humanity. And if you save one innocent human being, whether Muslim or non-Muslim, it is as though you have saved the whole of humanity. Hope that answers the question. Thank you, Doctor. Thank you. Thank you. Can we have the next question from the mic? Hi. Um... My name is Shanice and I'm a student uh, studying business. I'm actually curious about LGBT, which refers to the community of lesbians, gays, uh, bisexuals and transsexuals. So what Islam's point of view of this uh, issue? Because uh, I used to believe that we have to accept people regardless of their sexual orientation. So after I study some information about Islam, I know that Islam rejects this. So I want to know further about this issue. Thank you. Sister, that was the question of what is the Islamic view on homosexuals, on gays and lesbians. The ruling is that Allah says in the Quran, in Surah Araf, chapter number 7, verse number 81, do you prefer men in preference to women? That means telling to men that do you prefer men rather than women? Homosexuality is prohibited in Islam. Regarding, what about people who are homosexual? There's an article that came a few years back, homosexuality is genetic. And when this article came, people asked me in the question and session, if homosexuality is genetic, then who's to blame? The person is not to blame. It is Almighty God, correct? Later on, it was found that this is totally false. And the person who propounded this, he himself was a homosexual. What today psychologists tell us, that when a person goes beyond the limit, he keeps on wanting things which is unnatural. So today you see in the Western world, there is obscenity. Like my son said, the woman's talk of liberalization is nothing but a disguised form of exploitation of body, deprivation of a soul, and degradation of honor. The Western society claiming to uplift the woman had degraded her to concubine, to mistresses and society butterflies with a hidden behind the colorful skin of art and culture. In today's society, you have advertisement. In a motorbike advertisement, invariably there's a woman. Now, how many women ride motorcycle? Percentage by it? but you see a woman in the ad, why? And I was told of a very famous ad of BMW. I was told, in front of the BMW car, a woman is standing in a bikini, and the ad reads, test drive her now, who, the girl or the car? So they're selling their daughters, they are selling their mothers and they are saying that women are liberated. 
what happens that when you go beyond limits, all religions say that if you want to have relationship, you marry. Correct? According to American statistics, America doesn't agree in Islam. Islam says you can have more than one wife, that's a different question. In America, the American statistics tell us an average American, before he settles down with a permanent life partner, he has eight different sexual partners. Some may be having two, ten, twenty, average is eight. Eight different sexual partners before they settle down with one. So they are disregarding the law of the creator. Do you know, according to American statistics, every 12th person you meet has committed incest. Incest means having sexual relationship, brother and sister, son and mother, father and daughter. It's absolutely nonsense. Because they get so open, etc., they deviate from the natural path, so they want things which are different. So when they get so much used to it, having heterosexuality, they start homosexuality. It is not genetic, it is based on the things which you do, unnatural things, psychologically, you want something different, then you go to homosexuality. So if you stop this deviation from the path which is given guidance in the Quran and the other religions, what do you realize? This will stop. And I remember I'd been to Canada in 1996, first time, a man kissing a man. And Canada has legalized marriage of gays. Now, all this is coming because they're deviating from the truth. And today, psychologists tell us that a person who has no extramarital sex enjoys the best married life. You deviate from your normal thing, and this is what happens. So that is the reason if you follow the commandment of Almighty God, all these things will not happen. Therefore, in Islam, homosexuality, gays, lesbianism, everything is prohibited. Hope that answers the question. Can we have the next question? Yes. On behalf of the audience here today, I would like to take this opportunity to thank uh, Dr. Zakir Nair and earlier your son Farid and the organizer for uh, bringing us this uh, enlightened uh, lecture. And I'm very happy to see you today in person. Uh, and I much uh, also believe in what you say about peace and harmony. And I think today's topic about women's rights and the universal brotherhood is very timely. Yeah, and um, correct me if I'm wrong, I just want to... There are so many things which I agree with you. And I suppose the main essence is, uh, like what you said in the beginning, you know, should we, adherence of the major faith uh, religion in this world, if we uh, are the learned one, that means we truly understand the essence of the original spirit of all the major religions, then we will come to a common point where, be it what terminologies you use, whether it's a God, it's Allah, it's a Dharma, or it actually, in essence, it actually meant the one and only. Right, so if we could agree with that, then uh, interfaith dialogue would actually open the way for peace and harmony, and there would not be any uh, sort of things like, you know, differentiation, but more of diversity in harmony. Yeah, and I think one of my, um, uh, by the way, my name is Richard, I'm an executive recruiter. For me, although I'm born a Buddhist, but I study Islam, and I, if someone say I'm a Muslim, I'm very proud of it, yeah. And if someone say I'm a good Christian, I'm proud of it as well, because uh, my favorite verse in the Quran is uh, in Maeda, verse 48. I think it states very clearly that, you know, what is more important is the good work that we do, right? It's not so much, uh, uh, because if God has so willed, He has made us a single people, right? That's why He makes us a lot of religion, right? But He just want to try us and test us in what He gives us. But actually, all our ultimate goals uh, go back to God. And if there's any differences like we have today, if we refer back to the scriptures, whether it's the Quran or whether it's the Bible or whether it's the sutras in Buddhism or whether it's the Vedas, we will find that actually um, it refers to the same thing that you, you mentioned earlier. I have two questions which is related. Uh, first is regards the woman's right. I think about uh, interfaith marriage actually. Um, if from the Quran, correct me if I'm wrong, uh, I think one of the words is Ma'edar, uh, verse 5, where it stated that uh, lawful to you in marriage are actually the believers or the chaste women of the people of the book, right? Um, but of course, uh, that will depend on whether you take the uh, literal interpretation or you take the uh, tafsir makasidi, either the usili or makasidi. 
if you take the literal, of course, some people would uh, actually come to the conclusions which is actually upheld by many of the uh, majority of the uh, Muslim government today, right? Uh, states that the Muslim man is allowed to marry women of the people of the world, but not vice versa, right? Because if literally, it states only the chaste woman. It never said the chaste uh, man, right? If you look literal approach. But if you look at the Makassidi approach, which is the spirit of the law, and just now you talk about equality of the woman, and we know that uh, we have to look at the language of the day. Because those days, like we mentioned, mankind. Mankind refers to both men and women. This is the same thing we mentioned, chair, man. It actually can be a woman. That's why today we rather use humankind and chairperson. So, and because of the culture that day, of that time, most time is addressed to the male, but it meant the women as well. So if we were to interpret in that way, it would also suggest or meant to say that actually the women should be allowed to marry the men of the people of the book. So now the contention is what is the definition of people of the book, right? So the, of course, a lot of um, government, including in Malaysia here, I suppose uh, they take the, quite the strict interpretation, so much so that they claim there's no such thing as a pure people of the book. But I would like to lend your confidence in the sense that we find the common, the common grounds, the commonalities, right? In the sense that uh, if it's, this is a book, I will give it to you afterwards, right? This is a book by uh, Reza Shah Kasimi, a scholar under the Common Ground Initiative by Prince Jordan. And uh, it actually uh, contains a lot of uh, proof from the Quranic uh, verses, uh, for example, uh, 87, uh, 19 which actually uh, conclude that uh, religion like Buddhism is also considered a uh, people of the world. So my question is that, in light of all these things, and also to... Brother, I've got a question, I've got a okay, question. Okay. You have posed two questions, cut it short. As the moderator said, if it's two sentences, there's the question longer than it becomes a speech. Okay, okay, so sorry, because you're, I thought... You're I thought basically, I, should, I've understood, okay. brother. The two questions I've asked, mainly dealing with marry the people of the book, Surah Maida chapter 5, verse number 5, and regarding can Buddhists be called the people of the book? Correct? Two questions. Okay, so, okay. Uh, so I let me answer. Confirm. Okay, I just confirm. You want to ask one more question? No, no, no. This is, I just, number, number one uh, is the women, Muslim women, uh, in light of the truth of the Quran, uh, uh, should be allowed to marry. I understood that. I got the question. No need of repeating. My okay. memory is, mashallah, very good. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Okay. And before the question, you made a statement, I'll come and after my answer. Before you gave the two questions you asked, you made some statements, I'll comment that after I give the answer to it. Even that I remember. Okay, okay, thank you very much. Coming to your question that the Quran says in Surah Maida, chapter 5, verse number 5, that lawful for you on this day is the food of the LA Kitab and the women of the LA Kitab who are chaste. So based on this, a Muslim man can marry a chaste woman from the LA Kitab, but why is in the vice versa not allowed? His interpretation is many a time when word is used, chairman, it includes even woman can be chairwoman. When you say mankind, it means humankind. Quran in Arabic language is the same. When they say for man, many a times, most of the times it's included, but not always. But not always. For example, if I say as a doctor, that a woman gives birth to a child. It's woman, it's not man. Many a times man includes women, but not always. Similarly, in the Arabic grammar, when you know the gist, yeah, you are nas. Nas is actually male. But when I translate, oh, humankind, I say. So in Arabic also, it's the same. When the male is referred to, female is included, but not always. And that you come to know by the context. In this verse, it does say, lawful for you to marry a woman of the LA Kitab. So women never include man in Arabic, never. When I say woman, it never includes man. When I say man, it can include women. Do you understand? Do you understand or not? When I say man, many a times it can include women. But when I say woman, it can never include man. Even in English language. When I say chairwoman, can it include chairman? No. When I say chairman, can be chairperson. When I say mankind, can be humankind. When I say woman is right, does it be man's right? Does it mean? Okay. Yeah, Even in English language, when I say woman, a man will never be included. When I say man, many a time women are included. Though in the woman, the man is there. W-O-M-A-N, 
in writing man is included in woman but not in meaning <laughs> when you write w o m a n man is included in the woman theoretically but not practically the same way in arabic whenever the gender male is used many a times it includes both but never ever when female is used man is included coming now coming to the point what is the reason so your logic cannot be applied here in any language neither english neither arabic neither chinese also hopefully okay now coming to the logic you have to ask me why and i'll give you the answer the reason is first of all i differ with the majority of the scholars on this statement about women allowed that we'll discuss later i'll come to your main point why man is allowed to marry a woman ehle kitab but why not a muslim woman allowed the reason is that when a man marries a woman the woman leaves the house and comes to the man's house normally now if you marry a ehle kitab jews and christian the christian believes in all the prophets from adam up to jesus peace be upon him we tell the christian you believe one more that's prophet muhammad peace be upon him and we as muslims cannot degrade any prophet of the christians what we say from adam noah abraham moses isaac jesus we believe in all peace be upon them all we say believe in one more so the woman who comes from the christian family to the muslim family she is not hurt she has to believe in an additional prophet if a jewess comes she believes in all the prophet from adam peace be upon him moses peace be upon him we say believe in two more jesus and muhammad peace be upon him it's easy now if i take the wife versa if a muslim woman goes to a christian man's home that christian doesn't believe in prophet muhammad peace be upon him though he should according to the bible does not so when she goes to a christian house she will be insulted do you understand i understand your point uh, dr zakir nai i'm not complete uh, i'm not I... complete my answer yet okay 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 carry on sorry yeah so here because of that if a muslim woman goes she will not be allowed to follow islam so that the reason one way is allowed for a ehle kitab woman to come is allowed but for a muslim woman to go is not allowed i further disagree with the majority of the scholars this verse of the quran of surah maida chapter 5 verse number 5 says lawful for you the food of the ehle kitab and the women of the ehle kitab who are modest but there's one more verse in the quran in surah baqara chapter 2 verse 221 which says that you cannot marry an idolatress until she believes a believing woman even if she is a born woman is much better than an idolatress even if she allows you she may be a beauty queen she may be the richest woman in the world she may be the most beautiful woman in the world to marry a slave woman who is a believer who is a muslima is far superior to marry an idolatress even if she allows you and the verse continues that do not marry an idolater until he believes a slave man who is a muslim is a believer is far superior to idolater even if he allows you he may be the most handsome man in the world he may be the richest man in the world a slave man who is a believer is far superior this is the verse of the quran now one more verse of the quran of surah maida chapter number 5 verse number 72 says laqad kafara allazina qalu they are doing kufr those who say that jesus son of mary is allah they are doing kufr so one verse of the quran says you can marry from the ehle kitab who are modest one verse of the quran says you cannot marry those who do kufr those who do shirk another verse of the quran says surah maida chapter 5 verse 7 to 73 that they are doing kufr those who say jesus son of mary is almighty god based on this you cannot marry a ehle kitab girl who says that jesus is god who can you marry the answer is given in surah al imran chapter 3 verse 110 kuntum khaira ummatin khrijat lin nas ta'muruna bil ma'ruf wa tahuna 'anil munkar wa tu'minuna billah it says that oh ye muslim they are the best of people evolved for mankind enjoy what is good and forbid what is wrong and believe in allah and the verse continues walaw amana ahl al kitab laqana khaira lahum minum al mu'minin wa aksaram al fasikun if the people of the book had faith it would have been better for them among the ahl al kitab there are some who are believers who are mu'min wa aksaram al fasikun but the majority of fasik people are transgressor so according to me there cannot be a contradiction in the quran when the quran says you can marry women from the ahl al kitab one verse says you cannot marry those who do shirk for so they partners with god one verse says that those who say jesus is god are doing shirk 
But one verse says, there are among Ahle Kitab who are Mormon. That means today there are certain Christians, they are called Unitarian, not Trinitarian. Majority of the Christians are Trinitarian, they believe in Triune God, which is not allowed in Quran. Don't say Trinity. They said, stop it better for you. Surah Nisa, chapter number 4, verse number 171. According to me, you can only marry those chaste girls who are Jews and Christian, who don't do shirk, who don't believe Jesus is God and believe in one true God. Not any Mary, Sheila, anyone. So I differ with the majority because I am a student of comparative religion. The majority of the scholars say you can marry any girl from Ahle Kitab. I say no, you can only marry that Ahle Kitab who is a Mumin. Otherwise there will be a contradiction. So I believe only those Ahle Kitab, those girls, those women who believe in one God and don't believe Jesus is God. Based on that, I differ. And as I told you, does allow a man to marry a L.A. Kitab who believes in one God, but does not allow the vice versa, because that girl, when she goes to a Christian or a Jewish house, the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam will be degraded. They don't believe in it. So how can you continue? You can't continue having a vehicle, one tire of a tractor and one of a bicycle. Coming to your question that you posed earlier, that I'm happy to say I'm Muslim, I'm happy to say I'm a Christian. It sounds good, but for a person who has knowledge, it sounds contradictory. See, when I said, if Christian means following the teachings of Jesus Christ, I am more Christian than the Christian themselves. But normal terminology of Christian means a person who worships Christ. Correct? The normal terminology, majority of the Christians, they say that Jesus is God. So you say, I'm a Muslim, I'm a Christian, it contradicts. The moment you say Jesus is God, you can't be a Muslim. So that's the reason when you use words, if you know what does it mean, if you say Christian means following teachings of Christ, that means you're a Muslim only. But if you say Christian means the person who worships Christ, you can never be a Muslim. You can't say, I have got 10 rupees, and then tomorrow you will say that I have got more than 100 rupees. I'm in the original spirit. I don't believe Jesus is the son of God. All right, that means you're not like a normal Christian. Very good. Then if you say you're a Muslim, I can accept you. Very good. That's the reason when you do comparative religion, I'm very careful. When I say I'm a Hindu, geographically I'm a Hindu. At the same time I say, if you say Hindu is a person who do idol worship, I'm not a Hindu. I make it clear. I don't try and butter everyone. You understand? So same way if you say you're a Muslim. Muslim means a person who submits his will to God, who believes there's one God, who believes that God has got no image, who does not believe in idol worship, and who believes Prophet Muhammad is the last and final messenger. Brother, do you believe there's one God? Yes. Do you believe God has got no image? Yes. Do you believe idol worship is wrong? Yes. Do you believe Prophet Muhammad is the last and final messenger? I mean, uh, according to the Quran, it states so. Yes. So I, I, Do I you believe, believe in that in that same point? I believe. Allah. So if you believe yeah. that God is one, and if you believe idol worship is wrong, and if you believe that Prophet Muhammad is the messenger of God, then you are a Muslim. Then you qualify to be a Muslim. You can become more and more practicing later on. But if you agree with the basic, these two things are basic required for a person to enter Islam. After that, the other practices will come slowly and slowly. So if you agree there is one God, and if you say idol worship is wrong, and if you believe Prophet Muhammad is the messenger of God, you are a Muslim. And then I agree with you when you said that Jesus is not God, then I surely agree with you that you can be qualified to be called a Muslim. That, that, that's what I meant when I say uh, I, agree with I, you. I want to be a good Muslim, very good, good, good very Christian. Good. When I say I, I can be a good Christian, following the I teaching, meant, the true teachings of Jesus, yes, like yes, me, like yes, me. Very yes. good, I'm with you. Even yes. I want to be a good Christian. Yeah. What, what I meant, that, that is why I take the trouble to go into some background just to clarify that, you know, we have to uh, encourage everyone to go back Correct. to the original spirit and the truth Correct. of this, all the religious texts. Brother, would not, you? not the majority of what the followers very good very belief. good if you want majority, very good i agree with you think incorrectly i agree with the majority yeah. is not always right i agree with you you have to follow the scripture not the church yes brother now what you said in english that i'm a muslim etc would you like to say it in arabic no would you like to say it in arabic that there's one god and prophet muhammad is the messenger of god no I think uh, just to borrow the words of Prof. Tariq Ramadan, he says very... Uh, Sorry? Professor Tariq Ramadan. Prof. Tariq Ramadan. Yeah, yeah. I happened to attend one of his sessions, and I think he said very correctly. He said he has no problem with Islam, but only some Muslim. 
Christians. He has no problem with other religious texts, no Bible or sutras or Vedas in the original form, just like you, you said, you know, right? They believe in the one God or one yes. God. But it's the, the followers, the majority of them right now. Correct. You know? Same thing. Yeah. I'm not here to defend the Muslims. Every community of black sheep, I'm here to talk about Islam. And when you want to follow Islam, don't look at the Muslim, look at the Quran. Yes, but I'm asking you that once you believe there is one God and you believe that idol worship is wrong and you believe that Prophet Muhammad is a messenger of God, this is basic to gain entry into the school. Entry into the school first standard. Then you may become second, third, fourth later on. What I'm asking you, would you like to admit yourself to the school of Islam? Uh, Dr. Zakir Knight, uh, based on verse uh, 48 uh, Ma'ida, I think uh, Allah or God has made it so clear that it's it is not his will. You know, he said, if, if, if I had so will, I'll make you a single people, but that's not his plan. So in other words, uh, no, Allah no, no. knows best and no, that's all not knowing his plan. does not that, want... That sorry. verse of the Quran, if he wanted, he could have made everyone believe, then where is the test? If the teacher says, I, if I want, I can pass everyone, then no one will study. So Allah is telling, for him to make everyone believe is very easy. But because this is a test, as I quoted the verse of Surah Mul, chapter 16, verse number 2, Allah di khalaq al mawata wal hayata. It is Allah who has created death and life to test which of you is good indeed. If He makes everyone believe, then where is the test? He's already created that creation, the angels. The angels always follow Almighty God. But the human beings, with giving a free will, if they follow Allah's commandment, they are superior to the angels. If after free will they disobey, then they go lower than the angels. In this aspect, I would rather interpret this passage as a differentiation between the people of the book and the Mushrikuns. That means idolaters. I haven't come to your second question yet, people of the book. <laughs> okay. okay. Your question of people of the book, I haven't come to it yet. Yeah. That's your second question. Okay. I answered your first question and I've given comments on Can... what you spoke before asking the question. Your people okay. of the book, I haven't come to it yet. Okay, can, can, I, can I just uh, uh, sum up on two common points that we share in common? Number one, I think you, you agree uh, that uh, most of the time, if not all the time, when Quran or any other text that we see, you know, in those uh, culture, language culture, even today, you know, when you talk about a man, it will also include the women, right? But that answer I gave you now, brother. Yeah. Again, you're coming back to the same question. Did you forget no, my no, answer? No, 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 no. I agree. I just want to confirm. But when some... you say woman, the man is not included. I mean, uh, um, allow me to, to go a little bit further. I have uh, not answered your second question. You're asking me a third question. Because the... The moderator first... told one question at a time. First, you gave a speech, which I had to comment on. Then you asked first question. Then you asked second question. I have not answered the second question. You're asking me third question. Uh, that is okay. Please Please don't, I would love don't, to, get, I would, don't get me wrong. I'm not what, getting you wrong. I'm getting question... you right. But the moderator said one question at a time. Go yeah. behind the queue. I will answer your second question. I would love to answer. I'll be here. Even if everyone goes, I'll be here. I promise you. Yeah, thank you so much. Thank but you let so me much. answer your second question. You can but, go behind the other non-Muslim. I will be here. I will not leave. But the first question, uh, can I... I yet have to answer the second question of yours. Oh, but... So uh, don't you want the answer for that? Oh. Are the Buddhist LA Kitab? I have not answered that. Did you get the answer? Did I okay. answer? Uh, okay. Um, okay. I can understand your standpoint. I have about... not yet given the answer. How can you understand? Can you read my mind? Great, you I have Sorry, not Dr. Zakir Nai. I have not started my answer on LA Kitab. Dr. Dr. Zakir Nai, I'm referring to the first uh, answer that you gave to my first question. So you have spoken, so I think I know what you said, because all the audience know what you said. So, so of can, the first answer, second answer, where have I given? Uh, because the first answer, I beg to defer in certain areas. So can you allow me to, to, to give my viewpoints? I mean, the, to be, uh, yeah, at, two at the end of the queue. I love at the end of the queue. I'll give the second answer, then go behind the queue. I would love. But then there are about 7, 8,000, 10,000 people here. 4,000 in the auditorium, 6,000 outside. So you can go behind the queue. I'll just give the answer to your second question. The second question you posed that can we consider the Buddhist to be Ale Kitab? Ale Kitab in Arabic means people of the book. Kitab means book. Kitab also means revelation. It can be people of the revelation. In that way, even we have a book. Even the Muslims are Ale Kitab. But the terminology used in the Quran, Ale Kitab specifically refers to Jews and Christians and no one else. Ale Kitab is a word meaning people of the book, but in context of the Quran, it only refers to Jews and Christians. We have many prophets, but when the Quran says, O oh Prophet, tell your wives and the believing woman, it means only one Prophet, Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. So if you know the language, you can understand. 
that when the Quran says, O Prophet, do this, it is only referring to the last and final Prophet Muhammad and not the earlier Prophets. Similarly, LA Kitab means people of the book, even Muslims are people of the book. In, in definition. But when Quran says LA Kitab, it does not refer to Muslims, it only refers to Jews and Christians. So at the time of the Prophet, this idiom, LA Kitab, was only used for Jews and Christians, no one else. There are many other people who have got revelation. There are many other religions which have got book. But in the Quran, it refers to only Jews and Christians, no one else. It's very clear cut. If you know, if you know... It depends know, on the document, right? Because if you read the commentary by uh, our learned Prophet Hashim Kamali... Forget about commentary, I'm talking about the text. I'm talking depends, about the text, you're talking about commentary. It depends on how you interpret. It depends how you interpret, whether you interpret it using the, the literal or using the I'm makasit. giving the interpretation of the Quran. If you say, yeah, Ale Kitab, come to comment term, that means, oh, Muslim, come to comment term. What does it mean? If I say you can marry a woman from the Ale Kitab, Ale Kitab are Muslims also. So that means you cannot marry a man from Ale Kitab. Man is Muslim also. So that's the reason if I use your logic, there will be contradiction in the Quran. So yeah, which is. commentary you are following, I don't know. The commentary should match with the text of the Quran. If the commentary doesn't match with the text of the Quran and gives you a different meaning, you reject that commentary. This is my answer for the next question. You can go behind the queue. Okay, before I, before I go, just yeah, the last Please go the behind the sentence. queue, please. Please yeah, go behind the queue. To... I will inshallah answer. I will stay here. As long as you stay, I will stay here. Okay. I'll stay till morning also. Till morning. Okay, we have a private session afterwards. Not okay. private, stand behind the queue. Can we have the next question? Thank you. Assalamu alaikum. My name is Preet. I'm a non-Muslim. I'm of a Sikh religion. And um, I came across Islam like a year and a plus back through a friend. We are studying in the same university. And he introduced Islam to me. He gave me a couple of books to read because I used to look at the way he was practicing Islam. He used to pray and his talks, the way he used to talk to me. And then after some time, uh, I used to ask him a lot of questions. So he told me, why don't you read the Quran in the translated version? So that's what I did. So uh, I was pretty convinced after I read the Quran that Allah is the only true God and Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, is the only, is the last messenger. <laughs> but after some time, my parents came to know about it and they are very religious. So they are very unhappy that I was um, diverting into another religion. So they decided to take me to the temple to renew my faith. Despite the fact that I was um, not very happy, I could not object them because they would scold and like raise their voice and I didn't want to fight with them. So I just agreed, but I did not do it from my heart. I just did it to make them happy, to please them, to avoid any argument and all that. So now I actually want to ask you for an advice. What do I do? How am I supposed to convince my parents? How am I supposed to tell them that I believe this is the religion for me at least? Sister asked the question that she had been studying Islam since the past one and a half year. And she liked the teaching, she read the Quran, she got convinced that there's one God and Prophet Muhammad is a messenger. And later on when the parents came to know, they took her back to the temple and though she unwillingly had to obey the parents, she's asking, how can I convince my parents? There is a talk I've given in this book of mine, Concept of God in Major World Religions. Here what I spoke was only of four religions, Hinduism, Judaism, Christianity and Islam. If you see my full lecture, it even includes Sikhism. Sikhism. Sikhism, sister, is a religion which came towards the end of the 15th century in the land of Punjab. It was found by Guru Nanak Sahib. And what the scholars say, it's an amalgamation of many of the teachings from Hinduism and Islam. And it's a religion of 10 Gurus. And if you read the concept of God in Sikhism, if you read the text, not the practice, the text, if you read Guru Granth Sahib, if you read the first chapter, Adi Granth, the first verse is known as Japuji. It says that he is true. He is not begotten. And he is most powerful. Free from all wants. And has power over all things. And there is nothing like him. So this of Japuji matches very closely with Surah Ikhlas which I said. So theoretically, 
Sikhism definition of Almighty God is quite similar to definition of Quran Surah Ikhlas. That's the reason what Sikhs believe. They believe in, they give two names, Omkara, which has a manifest form, and Ek Omkara. And there are various attributes given to Almighty God in Sikhism. They call Almighty God as Sahib, which means Lord. They also call him as Rahim, merciful. They call him as Kareem, beneficent. They call him as Bahe Guru, one true God. And Sikhism is against idol worship. It's against Autarvada, Almighty God taking forms. It's even against idol worship. So the teachings of as far as concept of God is concerned, theoretically is quite similar. Practically, they do deviate here and a little bit. But otherwise, as far as concept of God is concerned, it is quite similar. What my advice to you would be, you can give the translation of the Quran even to your mother and father. And ask them to read. And tell them that, can you point out something which is not good? Or something which disagrees? So you have to be patient. And you have to tell them. And you have to do the duty of a true believer. First, I would like to know that you did say that you read the Quran and you did also say that you believe in one God but you never said whether you accept Islam or not but by believing there is one God believing idol worship is wrong believing in Prophet Muhammad you do enter into the fold but whether you did accept or not I am not aware I would like to ask you sister that would you like to accept Islam? Yes I would like to but at this moment I would want to think like want to know how am I supposed to convince my parents first because I don't want to do something like they are not of the knowledge and I told my parents that if I'm going to take any step I will inform you you will be informed before I take any step that's right so what I would request you as I told you that you can give my DVDs to your parents there are various DVDs and I know that so much of misconception there about Islam that most of the non-muslim would get afraid oh you're becoming a Muslim that you're becoming a terrorist no, you're going to follow religion of terrorists, you're going to violence. In fact, I always recommend that anyone who becomes a Muslim, especially the youngsters, first thing I tell them that there should be a difference between your behavior, what you did before accepting Islam and after accepting Islam. And as my son Farik, he told in a lecture that paradise lies beneath the feet of your mother. Even for you, sister, your paradise, even if your mother is a non-Muslim, paradise is there beneath the feet of your mother. Whether your mother goes to paradise or not is secondary. You understand, na? Because you have to love your mother, you have to respect your mother. That does not mean that if you become a Muslim, if you become, you have to disrespect your mother. So when your parents see the change, that fine, I have to request my daughter to do small things she never used to do. Now she's helping me, she's dabbing me, she's following my instructions. So you have to see that once you become a Muslim, there has to be a marked difference between your behavior, what was earlier and what was now. If previously you were a good daughter, now you have to be a better daughter. And when they ask you why, you say, this is the teaching of the Quran, this is the teaching of the Prophet. So once they find a marked difference in your behavior, in your kindness, in your obedience, if you are following 50%, try and follow 99.9 or 100%. If you are following 90%, try and follow 100%. Only those things, what they tell you, which goes against the teaching of the Quran and teaching of Prophet Muhammad's peace be upon him, those are the only things you should abstain from. Besides that, all what she tells you, even though you may not like it, you should do. So there should be a marked difference. For example, they may tell you, okay, wear clothes which are blue, and blue is not your favorite color. So if blue is not your favorite color, if your mother likes it, wear it. So she gets happy. You have to look after her, you have to care for her more, so that they should be forced to ask, how come this change is there? So once they are forced to ask you how the change is, because these are the teachings of the Quran. And that's what my son told in his lecture, what I gave a gist. So this is their sister. At the same time, you have to try and remove the misconception. I've written a book on the most common questions asked by non-Muslims. That book, I think it will be available outside. I would request the volunteers to give a copy to her. And these normally try and clarify the misconception what the media has spread about Islam. So if you give that book to read to your mother and father, maybe they will understand part of it, if not completely, and give the translation. And what I would say that never disrespect your parents. 
even if they do things which are wrong, you as a daughter should not disrespect. As the Quran says, you can't say oof to them also. But same time, only those things what they tell you which is against Allah and His Rasul, these two things, is the only time you can disagree but politely. All the other things you go out of the way to convince them and to be good to them, be kind to them, there should be a marked difference. And then inshallah, they will be happy. Initially, they would feel a bit sad because, but natural, they would think that you're going into a wrong religion. But later on, because of your behavior, they'll get convinced, and you never know, you may be the zariah for the Jannah. Like your mother, paradise lies beneath her feet, maybe you may be the zariah, you may be the path which will lead your parents to paradise. Hope that answers the question, sister. Thank you. Thank you. Can we have a question from Mike One, please? Uh, good evening, doctor. Uh, my name is Chong Nin. I'm a student uh, from IUKL. So I have two questions actually, but I'll ask the second one if the organizer permits later. So my first question is, okay, uh, just now in your talk earlier, you were talking about uh, brotherhood uni unity. So it sounds like a potential solution for religious harmony between uh, the many major faiths in this world. So the, big, the uh, biggest problem I, I think about is like uh, Christianity, there are many different sects, different religious, uh, I mean, David, uh, different uh, sections, different interpretations by preachers and humans. So, based on this human factor that tends to misinterpret a religion, uh, deviating from the main uh, text, the main content of a religion, what is your solution or your response to this uh, problem or to this biggest obstacle to brotherhood unity? But that's a good question that we find in some religion, and give the example of Christianity, that people interpret the scriptures differently, therefore you have different sects, etc. And that's what brings diversity, so what is the solution? Whether the solution is that you go back to the scripture, and if the interpretation differs, and by the different interpretation, if there's a contradiction, then you choose that interpretation which there's no contradiction. For example, you just heard, the earlier brother, when he asked that, why can't a man from Ali Kitab marry? And everyone agrees that you can marry from women from Ali Kitab. So I gave my reasoning that if I believe that you can marry any Ali Kitab, Mary, Sheila, so there will be a contradiction in the Quran. Because one verse of the Quran says you cannot marry a mushrika. And people who worship Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, are doing shirk. That's what the Quran says. So I come up with an answer in which there is no contradiction. So any logical person who hears both the answers will agree with my answer more or any answer in which there is no contradiction. Same with the earlier person who says, I believe Jesus is son of God. So if you believe Jesus, peace be upon him, is son of God, Adam is son of God, Ephraim is son of God, Israel is son of God. Do you give the same status as Jesus? He says no. So people say something but they don't mean it. So when there is a difference in interpretation, I say then why do you give so much respect to Jesus and not to the other prophets? What they are saying actually begotten son. And when they say begotten, I say that word has been removed from the Bible. So when you study, when you do an analytical study, analogical study, you come to the truth. As Jesus Christ, peace be upon said in the Bible, seek the truth and truth shall feed you, Gospel of John. So when you are doing research, you easily come to know which is the correct one. But if you follow blindly the church or a particular scholar, blindly without checking right or wrong, then you come into a problem. So that is the reason when you read a commentary of any scripture, what you have to see, how logical it is, and how well it is connected. And you have to take the scripture as a whole, not only one verse out of context. If you take one verse out of context and interpret it, you have to take the scripture as a whole. So when you take as a whole, and that commentary which fulfills the requirement is the correct one. So this has to be done with study, brother. And then you realize that which is the correct translation and interpretation of the scripture. Hope that answers the question. Thank you. Do you have any other question? You uh, said you had two questions. Yes, but then if the organizer okay. has enough time? No, because okay. we allowed the others, I would give the same thing to you, brother. Okay, so this is just a short question. So, so early on you were talking about uh, Muslim sh uh, should not pray towards an idol or object or anything uh, because God is formless and he is beyond our comprehension. So from my understanding, from just uh, what I've observed, it, 
I probably believe it's wrong, but when the Muslims perform their pilgrimage at Mecca, the direction of prayers are facing towards a stone pillar in the center. So, what is, uh, isn't this contradicting to what? Very good question. Earlier? The brother asked a very good question that if Islam is against idol worship, I did not say God is formless, I said God is imageless. There's a difference between formless and imageless. If you interpret your way, there'll be a big, big blunder. I said God is imageless, then I said God is formless. There's a difference between formless and imageless. Coming to your main question, that if Islam is against idol worship, when you go to pilgrimage and you bow down towards the Kaaba, isn't it same as idol worship? And this is then my book, The Most Common Question. It is number nine. The ninth most common question asked by non-Muslims about Islam is, if Islam is against idol worship, why do you bow down to the Kaaba when you pray? And the answer is, no Muslim ever worships the Kaaba. The Kaaba is our Qibla, it's the direction. Because we Muslims believe in unity. For example, today all the Muslims want to offer Salah, want to pray here. Some may say let's face north, some will say south, some will say east, some will say west. There will be disunity. So for unity, wherever you are, you face towards the Kaaba. This is the verse of the Quran of Surah Bakra, chapter number 2, verse 144, which says that when you pray, face towards the Kaaba. So Kaaba is the Qibla, it is not we worship it. Furthermore, Muslims were the first people who drew the world map. And al udrisi in 1154 was the first human being who drew the world map. When the Muslims drew the world map, South Pole was on top, North Pole down, Kaaba was in the center. The Western cartographers came and they turned the map upside down. North Pole top, South Pole down, yet Kaaba is in the center. So if you stay in the north, you face towards the south. If you stay in the south, you face towards the north. If you stay in the west, you face towards the east. If you stay in the east, you face towards the west. Kaaba is the center of the world. When people go for Umrah, when Muslims go for Umrah, or we go for Hajj, we circumambulate around the Kaaba. What is the reason we circumambulate? Because it's a commandment of Almighty God. But logically what I can think, that every circle has got one center. When we circumambulate around the Kaaba, we are testifying that there's only one God. And the statement of the second Khalifa of Islam, Hazrat Umar, he said it's mentioned in Sahih Bukhari, volume number 2, in the book of Hajj. Chapter number 56, Hadith number 675, Hazrat Umar, may Allah be pleased with him, the second caliph of Islam, he said that this black stone can neither benefit me, can neither harm me. I'm kissing it only because I've seen the Prophet kiss it. This statement that the black stone can neither benefit me or neither harm me is sufficient to prove that Muslims don't worship the Kaaba. And lastly, at the time of the Prophet, there were Sahaba who stood on the Kaaba and gave the Azan. No idol worshipper will ever stand on the idol he or she worships. So this proves that no Muslim ever worships the Kaaba. The Kaaba is the Qibla, it's only a direction. Hope that answers the question. Okay. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you. Okay, so we have time to take just one more question. So please go ahead, brother. Hi, my name is Ivan and uh, welcome to my beautiful country. I'd like to know your thoughts on Quran only Muslims, why they reject the Hadith, and how do they practice the religion without referring to the Hadith? Brother asked the question that there are Muslims who follow the Quran and reject the Hadith. And how can they follow Islam without practicing Hadith? If you follow the Quran, there are no less than 20 places the Quran says, Atiullah, Atiur Rasul. Obey Allah and obey the Messenger. If you follow the Quran, you have to follow the Hadith. If you don't follow the Hadith, you can't follow the Quran. Many places, including Surah Nisa, chapter 4, 59, says, Atiullah, Atiur Rasul. Obey Allah and obey the Messenger. So if you want to follow the Quran, you have to follow the Hadith. Quran is a telegraphic message. Many a time for details, you have to go to the Hadith. Quran says, give zakat. How much to give? You find in the Hadith, 2.5%. Quran says offer salah, something is mentioned, not details, you go to the hadith. So anyone who says that only follow Quran will not follow hadith, he cannot practically follow the Quran. Because Quran says, obey Allah and obey the messenger. So you cannot be a practicing Muslim until you follow Quran and the authentic hadith, the sayings of the last and final messenger, Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. Hope that answers the question. Okay, one last question. Uh, with so many school of thoughts in Islam, can you tell me what happened to Isa? Why the Jews wanted to kill him? Sorry, I didn't understand. What did you say? What did Can you tell me what happened to Isa? Isa Yeah. Jesus, Jesus came, huh? Why the Jews wanted to kill him and who was put in replacement of him? The brother asked the question that why did Jews wanted to kill 
Prophet Jesus, peace be upon him, who was replaced and what happened to him according to the Quran. The reply is given in the Quran in Surah Nisa, chapter number 4, verse 157. It says, They said in both the Jews that we kill Jesus, son of Mary. They killed him not, neither did they crucify him. It was made to appear so. All those who differ are full of doubts. With only conjectures to follow. For a surety they killed him not. So Quran says they did not kill him, neither did they crucify him. It was made to appear so. All those who differ are full of doubt. And then the next verse, Surah Nisa chapter 4, 158 says, Allah raised him up alive unto himself. So according to the Quran, Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, was not killed, he was not crucified. You asked him who was put in his place, I don't know. I know there are stories, Judas was put, this was put, Gospel of Barnabas. Quran says he was not killed, he was not crucified, for me it is sufficient. Who was put in his place, whether someone was put, I'm least bothered. Because Quran says anyone who differs is full of doubt. So even according to the Bible, I've proved. I had a debate, was Christ really crucified? And from the Bible I've proved that Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, was not crucified. But that will take time, you can refer to my video cassette. So from the Bible also you can prove Jesus wasn't crucified, peace be upon him. And even the Quran says he was not killed, he was not crucified, he is raised up alive. And Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, he will come back again. According to the Quran, according to the Bible. Any second coming, he will testify to the Christians. As Quran says in Surah Maida, chapter 5, verse 116, that I never told you to worship me, but I said, Oh, Abdullah, worship Allah, Rabbi wa Rabbi my Lord and your Lord. Same thing he mentioned in the Bible. Any second coming, he will tell to the Christians that you depart from me, I don't even know you. So Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, has been raised up alive because people insinuated that he claimed divinity. In the second coming, he will testify he never claimed to be God and he will come as the Ummah of Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Hope that answers the question. Thank you. Can we have the next question from the mic over the other side? Please post your name and your profession. A uh, very good evening, doctor. My name is Reva, and I'm a psychology student as well. The 9-11 question was from my sister. <laughs> but I'm not talking about 9-11. I have a separate question. And I'm having a sore throat, so I'll make the question quick before I run out of my voice. Well, I actually, I went to a Christian school. And there, I'm surrounded by a very good number of narrow-minded people. And they are, their narrow-minded people's beliefs are Anything except for Christianity is devil worship. So according to them, everything is devil worship. And for them, Islam is as well as devil worship. But I don't see it that way because if this is devil worship, it won't be the number one religion in the world. So <laughs> clearly there's something in Islam that Christianity doesn't have, which is why it's such a achieving and very a lot of people are in it so my question is i want to know what that something is so that's the question that she went to a christian school she was surrounded by christians who she called narrow-minded here you're surrounded with broad-minded people mashallah so she says that christianity says everything besides christianity is devil worship but she says that Islam is the fastest growing religion, maximum followers. So what is it, the in thing, that people are inspired towards? Sister, I have been in this field for Dawa for more than 20 years. More than 20 years I have been in this field of Dawa. And I have met many people who have reverted to Islam. From Christianity, from Hinduism, from Buddhism, from Sikhism. And each one is inspired by different things. But the most common factor among the people who accept Islam in my survey is the belief in oneness of God. The other people theoretically say Ek Ishwar, Ek Paramatma but practically they don't follow it. Christianity says believe in one God but they say Father, Holy Spirit and the Son. They talk about one but they practically believe in Trinity. So Islam is the only religion which speaks and practices Tawheed, monotheism. So this inspires a person about the one true God unity. And unlike other religion where you can see that, you know, God fighting among themselves, one God is taking the help of another God, and the devil can defeat the God. So all these things 
a normal person thinks is illogical. How can God be defeated? How can God die? In some religion, God dies also. So if God dies, then who rules the world? So when you see all these things logically, people normally blindly follow. These blind beliefs are not there in Islam. Therefore, Quran says that, do you not understand? This is for men of understanding. Even in my talk, I said that God Almighty made the heavens and the earth and made in colors and languages. Verily, it's a sign for those who understand. Quran is a book which convinces the logic. In spite the media today being against Islam, you can imagine the power that the amount of billions and trillions of dollars they are pumping against Islam to degrade it, yet it is the fastest going religion. So that's a miracle. <laughs> Allah says in the Quran, in Surah Imran chapter 3, verse 54, Makaru makrallah wallah khairul makreen. They planned and plotted, Allah to plan. Allah is the best of planners. So in this way, the major factor is that Islam is the most logical religion. There may be certain things which they may feel, oh, it's bad, it's like that. But when they come close to it, like today, today, Islam is malign. One thing is terrorism, second is that there are no women's rights. If there are no women's rights in Islam today, out of the Americans accepting Islam, two-thirds are women. So why are the American women accepting Islam? Out of the Europeans accepting Islam, two-thirds are women. If Islam is a religion that does not give rights to the women, then who's forcing the European and American women to accept Islam? Because they find the security. They have been and seen the world and lived talking about liberalization and modernization. They realize the real spirit is then the religion of Islam. So when they really practice, some people may really get inspired, okay, because there's hijab, bound to accept Islam. Some people only hear the azan and they accept Islam. So people have different things, but the main thing, the core factor is the tawheed. So whatever they're inspired by, once they come to tawheed, the oneness of God, he is our creator, he is our sustainer, he is our cherisher, which was the core factor of my talk today. Then, and these people who accept Islam, they become more practicing than those people who are born in a Muslim family. Sister, do you believe there's one God? Yeah, I do believe there's one God. Do you believe idol worship is wrong? Excuse me? Do you believe idol worship is wrong? Yes. Do you believe Prophet Muhammad is the messenger of God? I want to. So why don't you? Because I'm not inspired yet. I want to be inspired. <laughs> and nothing like inspiration. If you say you want to, if somebody is stopping you from... Myself, I, I want to be inspired. I want to know that that is the truth and That's the only right. truth. So maybe you coming to the lecture is not enough inspiration. You coming to the microphone to ask this question is enough inspiration for you since you believe there's one God, since you believe idol worship is wrong, and if you believe in Quran. Have you read the Quran? No. I would request you to read the Quran, and if you read the Quran, you'll understand more about Islam. And I had given a talk yesterday. Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in the various world religious scriptures. And I give quotations of Prophet Muhammad mentioned in the Hindu scriptures, in the Christian scriptures, in the Jewish scriptures, in the Buddhist scriptures. Only if you read, since your background is Hinduism, I believe. Christianity. Christianity. If your background is Christianity, have you read the Bible? Yes, it was a subject in my school. Fine, I'll just give you the references. Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, has been prophesied in the Old Testament and the New Testament. In the Old Testament, he has been prophesied in the book of Deuteronomy, chapter number 18, verse number 18. In the book of Deuteronomy, chapter number 18, verse number 19. In the book of Isaiah, chapter number 29, verse number 12. In the Song of Solomon, chapter number 5, verse number 16. <laughs> For details, you can refer to my video cassette. He is also prophesied in the New Testament. In the Gospel of John, chapter number 14, verse number 16. In the Gospel of John, chapter number 15, verse number 26. In the Gospel of John, chapter 16, verse number 7. As well as Gospel of John, chapter number 16, verse number 12 to 14. I'll just give you one prophecy to make it short. Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, said in the Gospel of John, chapter number 16, verse number 12 to 14, he said, I have many things to say unto you, but ye cannot bear them now. For he, when the spirit of truth shall come, he shall guide you unto all truth. He shall not speak of himself. All that he hears shall he speak. He shall glorify me. So this prophecy of Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, I have many things to say unto you, but ye cannot bear them now. For he, when the spirit of truth shall come, he shall guide you unto all truth. He shall not speak of himself. All that dear shall he speak, he shall glorify me. This refers to no one but Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. Because it says, he shall not speak of himself. All that dear shall he speak. And you know the history of Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, that 
Almighty God gave the revelation to Prophet Muhammad, most of it through Archangel Gabriel. Whatever he got, he repeated verbatim. And he shall glorify me. If you see, there is no messenger of God, no person who claimed to be a messenger has ever glorified Prophet Jesus except Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. So it's mentioned in the Bible that this man to come, he will glorify me. And all the other references I gave you, it is pointing out to the coming of the last and final messenger, Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. And even the Quran says, it's mentioned in the Quran in Surah Saf, chapter number 61, verse number 6, that Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, was sent as a messenger to the Bani Israel, to children of Israel, to the Jews. And he said, I give you glad tidings of a messenger to come whose name shall be Ahmad. And Ahmad is the second name of Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, is not prophesied only in the Bible, Old and New Testament. He's even prophesied in the Vedas, in the Puranas, in the Hindu scriptures, in the Parsi scriptures, in the Buddhist scriptures. As I was saying earlier, that even though the scriptures have been changed, even if the scriptures have been manipulated yet, there are remnants in the verses of that scripture about the oneness of God, that's Tawheed, and about Prophet Muhammad being the last and final messenger. Uh, now, Doctor, since that I've never actually read the Quran, may I humbly request that, can I have a translated version of the Holy Quran? Sure, inshallah, I request my, I request my wife to hand over a translation of the Quran. She will, inshallah, hand over the translation. And I request you that please read the translation. And inshallah, if you have any question, you can either ask to a local DAW organization or you can ask to Islamic Information Services or you can write to us, email, it's a global village. You can send the email to islam at irf.net. IRF.net is the short form for the organization Islamic Research Foundation. And inshallah, we'll try our level best to clarify our doubts. Hope that's the Thank you, doctor. You're welcome. Do we have a question from this mic yeah, here? Sure. I just first like to say thank you for coming here. And my name is Puya. So I'm a student drama. And I come from Iran, not Iraq. Iran, the old name Persia. So I come from a religious family. My father, I mean, my family are Muslim. But I was born as a Muslim. But I didn't want to be born as a Muslim because, you know, so as a family I born. But still I haven't accepted Islam because of some certain points. Uh, my main question was about, I mean, about the time like Asian time, back to the thousand years ago, when the time the Islam come to my country and we became a Muslim. So as I read in the history and those kind of stuff, I found it out that the Arab countries, so they attacked to my country and they invade my country and they brought Islam by force. Without my king accepted. So Persia was an old country and it was the most civilized country from the ancient time until now. We believe a real God, we were worshipping a real God, and our religious was Zartosh. So he was a prophet also. So we believe in good things, good thought, good words. So even Cyrus the Great, he was the king of the world and he was doing a lot of good things. Even some people they was confused that they called him Masih or Masih. He was doing many good things, but he was never said I'm a prophet, I'm a God. But even though that king, when he attacked the other country, he never killed the civilian, he never raped the woman, and he never made them to change the religion. Even somebody was worshiping a cow, he respect for them, even though he was worshiping a real cow. He can, he can, he could make them to worship also the same as what is worshiping. But in the Islam way, if you are, if you're gonna promote your religion, doesn't mean that you have to force it to somebody else, or you have to make them to accept that religion. Because, you know, human being means freedom. So anyone, they should have a right, human rights. So maybe those people, they didn't want that religion. So why they have to attack and, you know, to bring it by force? That was the main question that made my heart a bit, you know, <laughs> to make me to, my belief go down. So... Brother, are you Parsi? Pardon? Yeah, I'm from Fars, Fars. Are you a Parsi? You mean Farsi? Are you a Parsi? Are you a Zoroastrian? No, I, I'm not following any religion. You don't I'm belong not. to any religion? I don't, I don't believe. But you said the parents were? So? My parents are Muslim, but because of this confusion and stuff, I never try to follow the religion. I just believe in real God and doing the good things. So you That's believe right. in real God and good things. What are the good things? Where do you get the good things from? Good things like I don't harm the others. Whatever I'm doing, not try to harm the others. That's the first thing. As much as you can do the good things, even helping the others and believe in the real God, not worshiping a stone or leaf or whatever. And I believe God is single. 
So, but I didn't. So you have myself. your own philosophy. <laughs> so you want to bring a new religion? <laughs> I'm not gonna make any religion. I'm just following my brain because, as I know, God gave us a brain. So I didn't make my mind busy by following the books. I always, when I was 10 years old, I was just thinking, thinking, thinking until now even. So I tried to. Just thinking, my thinking. He's saying, God, as long as not a stone. Who told you stone is not a god? Anyway, <laughs> I'll answer your your basic question. Okay, your basic question is that Muslims came to Persia and they conquered and they forced people to accept Islam. So no one should force at all. I agree with you. Point to be noted is that today the media, the media, media promotes that Islam was spread by the sword. I am aware that there are certain black sheep in the Muslim community and there are certain Muslim rulers who did wrong things. But as a whole, Islam was never spread by the sword. Islam was never spread by the sword. It's spread by sword. Sword, sword. Sword. Sword means force. Force, yeah. Like you said, now Muslims came and conquered yeah, yeah. Persia, etc. You see everywhere it's happening. There are wars taking place. But in Islam, it's clearly mentioned in Surah Baqarah, chapter 2, verse number 256. Like Rafid Deen, there's no compulsion religion. Truth stands out clear from error. What we see today, if we analyze that we Muslims, we Muslims, we were the Lord of the Arab lands for more than 1400 years. For the past 1400 years, the Muslims were the Lord of the Arab lands. For a few years, the Britishers came, for a few years, the French came, but overall, the Muslims were the ruler of the Arab land. Yet today, there are more than 9 million Christians who are Coptic Christians. That means they're Christians in generation. If the Muslims wanted, they could have forced each and every non-Muslim to accept Islam at the point of the sword in the Arab land. These more than 9 million Coptic Christians, they are giving shahada. They are bearing witness that Islam was spread by the sword. We Muslims, we ruled India for more than a thousand years. We ruled India for more than a thousand years. If we wanted, we could have forced every non-Muslim Indian to accept Islam at the point of the sword. Today, more than 80% of the Indians are non-Muslims. These more than 80% non-Muslim Indians, they are giving shahada, they are bearing witness that Islam was spread by the sword. Which Muslim army has come to Indonesia? Indonesia today has the largest number of Muslims in any country, more than 200 million Muslims. In Malaysia, more than 55% of the citizens of Malaysia are Muslim. I am asking you, which Muslim army came to Malaysia? Your country, which Muslim army came? Which Muslim army went to the east coast of Africa? It was the business, it was the traders. When they came here, people accepted this religion. It is the media hype which talks about Islam was spread by the sword. Yes, there were a few people. There were a few black sheep of the Muslim community. Brother, you ask the question, you're listening or you're raising the hand? Okay, sure, sure. You ask the question, you give the background and listen to it and now you want to raise your hand. I have not completed my answer. Okay, sure, continue. If you ask the question, you should think. Because if you're thinking something, I'm a doctor. If you're thinking, that means you won't hear my answer. If I ask you to repeat, you won't be able to repeat 25%. So when you listen, you should give attention. I'm a doctor. I've done psychology also. <laughs> so, this is the media hype. If you read Thomas Carlyle, Thomas Carlyle, historian, he writes in his book, Heroes and Hero Worship. He puts number one hero prophet as Prophet Muhammad He's a Christian. He says, if every new idea originates in one man's head, one man's head it dwells alone in the full world. It will do little good if he takes up a sword and propagates it. You have to first get your sword. He's talking about sword of intellect. There was a survey done in the Plain Suit magazine. A survey in the increase of the major world religions in a span of 50 years. In a span of 50 years, from 1934 to 1984. In a span of 50 years, the increase in the major world religion. It came in Reader Digest, Almanic Yearbook, 1984. Number one maximum increase in religion, it's Islam, 235%. Christianity, only 47%. I'm asking you, which war took place between 1934 and 1984, which forced the non-Muslim to accept Islam? Which war? Which war? Today, today, leave aside the past, today, 
the fastest growing religion in America is Islam. The fastest growing religion in Europe is Islam. I'm asking you, who's forcing the Americans to accept Islam? Who's forcing the Europeans to accept Islam? You were not there born. Were you present in the past? Arabs came to my land and forced. Where were you present? This is history. Many things in history is false. So Pro that's what? what? Okay. okay. <laughs> <laughs> A very famous historian, Dilese O'Leary, he writes in the book, Islam at the Crossroad, page number eight. He says, history makes it clear. History makes it clear that the legend of fanatical Muslims sweeping across the world, forcing Islam at the point of the sword, is the most fantastic, absurd myth that historians ever repeated. Who says that? Dilesi O'Leary. History makes it clear that the legend of fanatical Muslims forcing Islam at the point of the sword over what conquered races is the most fantastic, absurd myth that historians ever repeated. This is just in the media today. Muslim terrorist, Muslim terrorist. I am asking you, did any Muslim attack you in this country? No, never. But the media says Muslim the terrorist. Yeah, media is just nonsense. Yes, same way your history is also nonsense. <laughs> when media is nonsense, the history is also nonsense. Some is correct, some is wrong. That's the reason if you hear the answer. I would like to end my answer with the quotation of Dr. Adam Pearson. Dr. Adam Pearson says, that people who worry that one day nuclear weaponry will fall in the hands of the Arabs, they fail to realize that the Islamic bomb has already been dropped. The bomb of peace, it fell the day Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, was born. Okay, thank you, doctor, for your answer. But the point is, I didn't get the right answer Brilliant. because that's not media, that's his story. And his story is not something that can be written the false way because if it be written the false way, it can be changed. But that was the true history in all over the world and is written every place. Brother, did places. you hear my quotation of Delacy O'Leary? Can you repeat it? Repeat what? Repeat Delacy O'Leary's quotation. I said it twice, not once, twice. Most what? of my answer was once. I said twice. Now repeat it. Repeat it to 50%. So what's the point of repeating that word? I want to know whether you, it went into your head or not. No, because... That's what is in my head is, that is a history first thing. I'm media. asking you, can you repeat the statement, the answer which I gave earlier? If you cannot repeat, that means it's useless me repeating the answer. You're not listening to me, you're thinking something. No, I'm listening to you. You're can you repeat, that, that is major, can, that is can false, you that's repeat the statement of Delacy O'Leary, a very famous historian? No, I can I can't. I'm saying it for third time, listen. Listen to it and go behind the queue. Delacy O'Leary says, that history makes it clear the legend of fanatical Muslims forcing Islam at the point of the sword over what conquered races is the most fantastic, absurd myth that historians have ever repeated. Delacy O'Leary says history has been telling falsehood and you're saying history, I believe in history. Delacy O'Leary is saying that what history says that Muslims are forcing Islam at the point of the sword is the most fantastic myth that historians have repeated. So you have got influenced by the myth. So now think it's a myth and forget it and believe in the fact. The fact is you read the Quran and inshallah I want you to revert to Islam. Revert back to the religion of your parents inshallah. Okay. Okay, okay, thank okay. you. Thank you. The last question for the night. Dr. Zakir Naich, uh, allow me to read to you about your comments about the people of the book only limited to the uh, Jews and Christians. This is a commentary by Prosh Hashim Kamali. I think he's quite an authority in Sharia. It's based on the words of the Quran. Those who restrict the category of Ali al Kitab to Jews sorry, and Christians. Sorry, sorry, sorry. What is the name you took? Which is the name of the famous sorry? person? You said yeah, because just now, what uh, was the name of the commentary? Who wrote it? Prof. Hashim Kamali. Hashim Kamali, I haven't heard of him. First time I'm hearing. Yeah, please Google him. No, he's no, you said he's very famous. He's the chairman of uh, Institute of Advanced Islamic Study in Malaysia. Maybe famous in Malaysia. Yeah, yes, yeah. Maybe he's, he's, uh, he may be. He may be good scholar. I'm not saying bad. Yeah, I'll, I'll, pass you, I'll pass you his book. You can read. But yeah, right but now, just for the uh, benefit of I haven't of heard the, of him. He may be a good person, he may be a good scholar, I'm not disagreeing with that, but I personally haven't heard of him. Yeah, yes, no. you can read the commentary. Okay, okay, this is based on the Quran. He says that those who restrict the category of Ali al-Kitab to the Jews and Christians 
quote in authority, the Quran, chapter 6, verse 156, which declares that books were revealed to two groups before. But the context where this phrase occurs actually questions rather than endorses the spirit of such limitation. Let us briefly examine the context. The verse, chapter 6, verse 156, immediately follows two other verses, one of which affirms the veracity of the Torah that contain guidance and light. The succeeding verse refers to the Quran itself has the blessed book, Kitabun Mubarakun, and an authoritative source. And then comes the verse 6, 156. Lest you should say, bracket, thing, that books were sent down to two, bracket, groups of people, bracket, only, before us, and for our part, we remain unacquainted with a reveal book. The tone brother, of the discourse brother, here brother, is brother, expressive. Brother, all this doesn't make a difference. I'll give the reply again to you. All this doesn't make a difference to me, even I'm a student of the Quran. Let me tell you one thing. I want to repeat the answer which you have not heard correctly. I told you by meaning LA Kitab means people of the book. It can also mean people of the revelation. In that context, even Muslims are LA Kitab. Allah has sent many books. Quran says in Surah Raj, chapter 13, verse number 38, the Kulli Ajlin Kitab. In every age we have sent a book. That's the definition. But when Quran uses an idiom, Ali Kitab, it only refers to Jews and Christians, no one else. If I agree with that person, I don't know what context he's talking about, then there will be big chaos. Among the Ali Kitab, there are those who say this. And it says, Ali Kitab believe in law and gospel, meaning Torah and the Injil. With these, there are many verses in the Quran. With this, it is 100% sure that whenever Quran refers to LA Kitab, it only refers to Jews and Christians as an idiom. Otherwise, there are many other people who are LA Kitab. But when the Quran refers to it, and I give you the example, when Quran says, Oh Prophet, tell your wife and the believing woman. You ask me, who's a prophet? Adam is prophet. Noah is prophet. Abraham is prophet. Musa is prophet. Jesus is prophet. But when Quran says prophet, it specifically refers to no one but Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. I gave you the answer. You didn't hear it. I hear you, but I hope this that is you the also... answer. I disagree because if I follow with that, there'll be contradiction in the Quran. I don't agree this contradiction in the Quran. Quran says, Ale Kitab, believe in Torah and the Injil. Now you will say, Buddhists believe in Torah and Injil. They cannot. Dr. Zabir, and I, 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 think, I think we should learn how to agree to disagree. Not agree and to I disagree. Think, what you are yes. saying, if I agree with you, I'll I'm have not, to believe I'm not that. I'm asking you to agree with me. I'm just Brother, uh, I must sharing your view. I an disagree with you. you shared of the view imminent, of an imminent, uh, bud, uh, imminent Muslim scholars. There are many eminent people who can make mistakes and there are many good scholars who have made mistakes. I don't disagree he's not eminent. I'm not saying he's not eminent. Okay, since, Where since did you I say, say Abdullah, this Abdullah Yusuf Ali which I quote, this Dr. Abdullah Yusuf Ali, brother, brother, you want to keep on speaking? Have you come here to give a speech? This book which I refer, the translation, Abdullah Yusuf Ali, According to me, it's the best translation available. There are mistakes in this also. Just because it's best, it doesn't mean because human beings are bound to make mistakes. I'm a human being, I can also make a mistake. But the point to be noted is when we do research, if we find one mistake, I don't reject everything. Because he then claimed to be God. This translation is one of the best translations. Even this translation has got mistakes. So what we have to realize, that a human being cannot be perfect. So that person may be eminent, but I disagree with his interpretation. You and I disagree. So why are you coming and hopping again today? I've given you a reason why I disagree. What do you have to do? Okay, fine. This verse of the Quran interpret this way. You have to counter my argument. You're not countering, you're reading from the book. I, reading from the okay. book is a waste of time for us and for everyone. Because I've given you quotation from the Quran, which says about Ali Kitab and refers to Jews and Christians only. It's this talking is also, about Torah. This is also from the Quran, and it states that actually you should have an open interpretation. And can I ask you a question, Dr. Zakir? Are you also a human? Of course I'm a human. So are you also bound to make mistakes? I can make, but to prove I made a mistake, you have to prove where my mistake is. That, that's why, <laughs> that, is, that is why I state to you from a commentary from an eminent Muslim scholar, but not I'm, from my own interpretation. But if that, but that about, eminent is not matching with the Quran. My interpretation, what I'm talking is based on the Quran. And majority of the scholars, Majority Jumur scholars of Islam believe Ali Kitab means only Jews and Christians. There are so many Ibn Taymiyyah, I can name 20 or quoting one which I have never heard of. Ibn Taymiyyah, you read Ibn Kasir, you read Tabari, all of them say Ali Kitab. What do you have to realize? I'm quoting Tabari, I'm quoting Ibn Kasir. 
all these top commentaries, all of them say that even Abdullah Yusuf Ali, even Abdul Majid Daryabadi, all of them say, Ahle Kitab, me Jews and Christians. Now you get what Malaysian fan, you may respect him, I've got no objection to that. Therefore, when you see, you have to give evidence. That evidence doesn't hold good for me. That's the reason I say that I believe in the commentary given by eminent, not one, hundred scholars, hundred. So when one is against hundred, if it has proof, if it's worth considering, I consider. If it's not worth considering, I don't consider. If you want to believe in it, you have full right, no one can force you. Hope that answers the question. Wa akhirat dawan, alhamdulillah, rabbil alameen.